Greetings and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm Mike Merwicki, State Representative for the Wyndham Ford District of Putney, Dummerston, and Westminster. Uh, as we have in the past, we'll be having a show today featuring some of the things that are happening at the grassroots level here in our, in our community. Uh, we're going to have two guests today, and today's first guest is Chloe Leary. Um, Chloe is the Executive Director for the Prouty Center in um, West Brattleboro, right, right across from Memorial Park. Um, let's assume people don't know a thing about Prouty, which for the most part is, is true. Uh, yep. Tell us a little bit about what you do there and how Prouty serves the community. Sure. Um, the Winston Prouty Center has actually been around for 45 years this year. So we've been wow. around for a long time. Um, and we started as uh, one of the first preschools in the country to serve children with disabilities. Uh, and the reason we're called the Winston Prouty Center actually is because our senator from Vermont, Winston L. Prouty, was a sponsor of one of the first bills that said kids with disabilities should be educated also. So that's our history. And over the years, what's happened is uh, we've expanded and grown to the point of serving all children and families, that uh, realizing that optimal child development means working with families to help kids be the best that they can be. So we have an early learning center on site, about 55 families right now who have their kids there. And we also do family supportive services through children's integrated services. A lot of people don't know we have community-based services. We go into homes, other preschools, uh, and support families and children in those environments as well. So uh, Now, the, is that program something that originates from Prouty, or is that a collaboration? The, uh, several years ago, the state of Vermont wanted to pull all programs that serve uh, families with young children into an integrated model. So uh, it came down from the state level, and uh, different funding streams come through different organizations. So as one of the major uh, participants in um, one of the services, early intervention, used to be called the Family Infant Toddler Program, which lots of people know. Uh, we got involved in bringing together the community partners, and we are actually the regional fiscal agent for children's integrated services in our region. So uh, as the fiscal agent, we're responsible for pulling all the collaborative partners together, which includes HCRS as our community mental health agency, Wyndham Child Care as our local resource and referral agency, and then we do a lot of work with all the providers in the community through WIC and the Department of Health, um, and actually anybody that, any other organization that works with kids and uh, with families with young children, yeah. we're, we're there. So what ages children do you serve? The Early Learning Center has ki children 15 months through age five. and So uh, you, you don't do infant care? We don't do infant care yet. Yet? <laughs> um, as I said, you know, we, we keep expanding and growing our programs. The need is there, and certainly that is something in our community that uh, it's, it's hard to find infant care. So that, um, as we look to the future and our strategic plan, we are adding on, and we will be anticipate adding on infant care. Mm -hmm. so, um, so hopefully birth, well, six weeks um, to age five. And then Children's Integrated Services is actually prenatal uh, through age six. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so, so you've been growing, and it sounds like you've got plans to grow some more. We do have plans to grow some more. We, uh, actually, it's funny, a lot of people still go to Oak Street, where they think we're located. Community House is now on the corner of Oak Street and High Street. Uh, we, we moved seven years ago, I think, we're in, um, across from Living Memorial Park, and we've already outgrown that space. We need more space for programming and for staff who support families in the community. So we are going to be launching a capital campaign and adding on to our building and adding space. Good so. work. Um, I feel like <clears throat> what you're doing is implementing some of the policies that we've been talking about in the legislature for years, and especially with Governor Shumlin, who has really made a big commitment mm -hmm. uh, to early learning. I think he understands that's an investment in our future, and um, these, these are dollars well spent. Um, which brings me to uh, some other work that's coming up as um, part of that statewide effort to raise the profile of, of what's happening for children and families. There's the, the Building Bright Futures uh, Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what your, your role is in, sure. in that? So the Building Bright Futures initiative, again, is a state level. There's a state council that is about focusing policy, looking at systems and policies that impact families with young children and, and trying to make uh, 
the best policies we can for all the children of our state. So each region has a local council. We have one here in Wyndham County. And uh, I participate as a volunteer, as a provider, and lots of um, other people do as well. Uh, and we try to in inform the community, educate the community about what's happening at the state level, as well as have some impact back up and feed back up to the state. Here's what's happening in our community. Interestingly, uh, communities are really different in terms of what they're struggling with. So some, com you know, I think our community um, has focused a lot on early education, even though Building Bright Futures is about more than, it's early childhood development and family development. So it's really important people often think it's about childcare or early education and it's about good health and about family support and about all sorts of dimensions of support. So, um, so we work together as a coalition and bring in, try to bring in lots of providers to work on these issues and, and come together. Um, one of the things actually this fall that's been from the Building Bright Futures Council has been working on food security. And this is a, you know, Hunger Free Vermont, partnering with Hunger Free Vermont to be part of their, um, they had an information day at the co-op. And so those are the types of things we do um, is work on issues for that impact kids. So the program at Priority is year round? It is year round. So the Early Learning Center is year round and then uh, the community-based services are also, you know, whenever people need help, they need help. So, um. Um, Without going into details in terms of names of people, but let's say a family shows up at Priority. Uh, take me through the process. For community, for Children's Integrated Services. So we get referrals from lots of different places. Um, we might get a referral from um, family services or uh, a com another community <coughs> provider. They, we, we make sure that the family knows about the referral. We'll contact them. Uh, somebody from Children's Integrated Services will go meet with the family. It's a purely voluntary program. So talking with the family about what do you need, what are you looking for. If the child has a developmental delay or potential delay, then that's sort of a set of services around child development through early intervention. If it seems like they are, are struggling with homelessness or budgeting. There's family support and social work. So it's really looking at what the family needs support with, connecting them with the right provider. And that provider, you know, holding the family and saying, what, how, how can we help build your capacity so you can take those next steps? It's definitely not about doing things to families. It's about helping uh, children and families get what they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. And connecting with the community? Absolutely. You know, I, I think that's something um, that probably is something we've, over the past several years, gained a real reputation among the <laughs> provider community for um, collaborating and making sure that we know who, what other families are working with and pulling in other resources. So um, in, including typical, you know, resources any family might access. So, you know, we work with families who are looking for housing or trying to, you know, find an apartment or find a way to make their living sustainable because affordable housing is challenging in our community, I will say. Um, what I've noticed happens is families come in and out of crisis or in and out of need. So, uh, you know, I can think of a family um, that we've supported that over, you know, several months got housing, found early care for their children, got a job, got a therapist, yeah. really got everything in place, was doing really well, and that lasted for a while. And then Sometimes something happens, you lose a job, we're right there. Yeah. They came right back, we were able to help them again. So, you know, that um, respecting that life goes in waves and being available. If you are a family with a child prenatal to age six, you are eligible for Children's Safe. Integrated Services. You don't have to fill out paperwork, you don't have to meet the income requirements. You can get help, you can get support, and that's what we do. I think one of the things that, um, you're implementing is years ago all these uh, services were in different places so it there's a coordinated effort happening yes. now yeah, yeah. And, and then if, you know if families have to go to um, so many different I don't know who my worker is I don't know where I have to go and that still happens you know there's still um, lots of different places that families need to go for resources but we try really hard to at least help keep that coordinated um, we talked a little bit earlier about the community, not really knowing the extent of what you do there. Um, what would you like to take people to take away from their sense of priority? 
Knowing that Prouty is an organization that uh, believes in being part of the community and doing whatever it takes to support children and families in our community. Yeah. So we do that through our early, early learning center and we don't contain it. You know, we believe that we can help, um, uh, you know, we work with Triple E, for instance, at Wyndham Southeast really closely through our early learning center. So that understanding that collaboration that we're not isolated. We're gonna find ways to collaborate to make um, sort of the best supports and services, whether it's on site in our programs or in the community, because we are out in the community and doing yeah. a lot of work out there too. One of the things that we've realized is that if kids come to school ready to learn, um, they're probably gonna, gonna do okay. If they come with delays, um, sometimes they never catch up. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the kind of, as I said, what you're doing is implementing some of the policies and ideas we've had for years and, uh, and, and actualizing that. So I mm -hmm. appreciate what you're doing uh, in, in terms of helping families, helping community, um, helping our schools, and, and helping build a, a brighter future for Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, um, if people want to get in touch with you, get in touch with Building Bright Futures, um, how would, how would they find out more information? Do you have a website we for do. Prouty? We have a website, so winstonproudy.org. Uh -huh. And we're launching a new website soon. Very excited. Uh -huh. So, uh, And Building Bright Futures actually has a website as well. So that's mm -hmm. I think it's buildingbrightfutures.org yeah. as well. Our search will we'll bring it up. Now, so. is Building Bright Futures a state organization now in terms of being a part of state government, or are they a standalone? They're... Um, it is a 501c3, but it is written into the legislation that right. it needs to exist in the definition of the council. And then each regional community, it's defined differently. So we're just a lo loosely structured coalition right now in our community. Yeah. Um, but that's a good, it's a, it's a good I, I think it has the most promise for continuing to implement mm -hmm. these kinds of policies. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Chloe. Thank you. Um, appreciate your work. Appreciate you taking the time for us, and, and uh, hopefully you can come back and tell us more about the ongoing work at Priority and, and your expansion. Great. Thanks, okay. Mike. Thanks a lot. Our, our next guest on the program today is Ann Braden. Uh, Ann has been working hard, again, at the grassroots level and helping to create what's now a statewide organization called Gun Sense Vermont. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, and, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, obviously, you're inspired. You're doing some great work. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about what inspired you to, uh, to start this work and to help us move uh, to what I call the, the pursuit of um, gun safety laws for the 21st century now that we're in the 21st century? Um, well, you know, one year ago, I, we all remember uh, finding out about what happened in Newtown. And for me, that was a moment of, of clarity in that something had to change. You know, we couldn't just expect things to stop happening if we did nothing. And so from that moment on, I was, you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, what makes sense? What can we do? You know, um, and, you know, I was sort of going about it in a normal, you know, a pretty average way where I thought, well, okay, I'll, you know, I'll email, like, some people, see if I can help, or, and what happened was I just sort of kept saying yes to things, like, yes, I can help do that, and yes, I can do that, and, um, and then there was this day in January, um, and I'm sure people in uh, um, Wyndham County who are parents remember it, it was, there was a lockdown at the schools, or a semi-lockdown, and because there was sort of this vague threat, and, you know, my husband teaches at the high school, and I was sort of in the middle of, you know, trying to get in touch with some people to see if I could do, help out. And it was just like, oh my gosh, the universe is saying, you know, there's no time to be wasted, you know. And, and not only was there that lockdown, but, you know, at the high school they had a fire drill on that day. And so yeah. my husband was, is sort of in this position of, do I send kids outside? Do I keep them inside? You know, I just thought, this is not a sustainable way to, yeah. to go about things. And Certainly so, not a great learning environment. Yeah, it is not a great learning environment. And yeah, and so I, I just felt, you know, I was a teacher before and I could just picture that so easily. And, um, and so it really sort of lit the fire under me that, okay, it's, we've got to do something. And, um, and so what really 
we've moved into is just, you know, I, I learned a lot about where we were as a state in terms of our gun laws or lack of gun laws and what the history behind it all was. And it, it was clear that without any organized movement, there couldn't even be a conversation about these things, you know. You couldn't even bring up the word firearms or guns and have, you know, have a real discussion. And so what we've been trying to do is, you know, organize people together who, are, who believe this is an issue that we have to be talking about. You know, we have to be discussing this issue and it's complex. You know, there's, there's no easy answer. There's lots of, you know, lots of different facets that all have to be really thought about and figure out, okay, what makes the most sense for Vermont? You know, what problems do we have? You know, we don't have all problems. We don't have no problems. Like, let's figure out what makes sense for Vermont and, you know, and what's an appropriate way to approach that. And so it's been really, it's been really inspiring to see how um, enthusiastic the response is, you yeah. know, in talking to people. And, you know, we've, so we started as an organization in Mar March, and now we have um, over 2,000 people uh, across the state. And, and it's, I mean, grassroots is, it's not easy <laughs> work, but it is, I mean, talking to people who are committed about this issue and feel like there is middle ground, you know, yeah. that we can make progress on this. And I just have, so much hope that, you know, as a state, we can really be a leader of, like, we can be pro-gun and pro-responsibility. Yep. Um, and so it's, it's been really satisfying work to do. Good. Um, what's your connection to Newtown, Connecticut? Um, my mom and stepfather lived there. Um, and that's one of the reasons it really hit home for me, because when I pictured that elementary school, I pictured an elementary school, not a crime scene. You know, I, you know, I, you know, it's one of those places where it's it's a reg it's a really regular town. Like it's pretty as stereotypically regular as you can come, um, and so you just think if it can happen there, you know, we are fooling ourselves to think that it can't happen anywhere. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we you can't prevent all violence, but you can make sure that you've taken whatever precautions are reasonable to take, and that it falls to us to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, one of the things a lot of us are talking about is that. Um, Vermont really doesn't have any checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reality is um, not everybody should have unfettered access to firearms. Mm -hmm. What we're finding out is uh, people who are struggling with mental illness, um, people within domestic violence situations, mm -hmm. um, probably shouldn't have easy access to a firearm. And people who are depressed and suicidal probably shouldn't have easy access uh, to a firearm. What what are the what are the goals mm -hmm. for for gun sense for Mark? Well, I think you know, like what you're talking about. There's sort of this general consensus that there are certain groups of people that you know we don't they they shouldn't have access. Um, and so, really, what we want um, to happen is have a conversation about okay, how can we make sure that we're doing the best job we can to ke keep guns out of the wrong hands. And so sometimes that's education, sometimes that's legislation, sometimes it's changing the social norms so that it's like, you know, with drinking and driving, it's now socially acceptable to say, okay, I'm going to be a good friend, I'm going to take the keys away from you, you're not safe to drive. And I think with depression, we need to have the same sort of status quo of, I'm going to be a good friend, I'm going to just remove the gun from your house for, you know, a few months until you start feeling better. Um, and so I think it, you know, it takes a variety of ways, but, um, but you know, right now there are some laws, um, but we need to make sure that they can be enforced as well as they should be. Um, and we need to make sure that where the loopholes are, that we plug those loopholes. Well, what are the, the statistics on uh, suicide by firearm in Vermont? Um, well, suicide, unfortunately, is one of the, we are one of the highest states. Um, I think we're 12th in the nation in terms of suicide rates, and our youth suicide rate is particularly high as well. Um, and there's, you know, there's a, about a majority, I think it's 26 out of the 50 states have safe storage laws where it is, um, you know, illegal to allow a child unsupervised access to a firearm. And, you know, it's, they have different. They look in. They come in different sh forms, but um, but that's the type of thing where you know, responsible gun owners agree. <laughs> Safe storage is a responsible way to own a gun, and so um, giving it more weight with some legislation 
as something that could really help reduce um, youth suicides in particular. And there's um, lots of research from the Harvard um, uh, Injury Center, um, Firearm Injury Center, where they look at lethal means restriction. And that is something where it can really have um, really reduce suicide rates much more drastically than other kinds of interventions um, because you know there's there's this perception that oh if someone you know wants to try to kill themselves they're going to find a way to do it and that's true for some you know for a, a I think it's about 10 percent but 90 percent of people if they don't succeed in that first attempt they continue to live they you know they're able yeah. to get the help they need and they are able to just live out a healthy happy you know generally happy life. And, you know, so that, that attempt, how fatal that is, makes a huge difference. And with firearms, um, you are successful 85% of the time. And yeah. it's just not the case with, you know, pills and uh, anything else. It's, you know, it's, people are much more likely to succeed with a gun. Yeah. Um, and so it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, Background checks are something that's being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, how much of a hassle would that be for Vermonters? Um, I think you know that a lot of the way that many states do it to have uh, you know universal background checks. The idea is that you could you want to be able to make sure that every time a gun is sold, there's a background check. Um, and that know, doesn't happen in Vermont. It it do, it, it doesn't happen. Um, well, so there's, there's federally licensed dealers, and it happens there. Um, there's gun shows, and in the past, it, you know, uh, two years ago, it wasn't happening necessarily at gun shows. Last year, they did a great job and had voluntary. They, um, within the gun shows, they decided to include background checks. And so that's wonderful. It would be great to back that up with legislation um, so that it, it stays like that. Um, but then also there's, you know, on the Internet, there's, you know, just Craigslist type sales and when it's private to private there's no way to make sure that that person isn't a f you know a violent felon or you know has a domestic abuse order against them um, and you know if you're if you are a violent felon you're going to take that route to get a gun rather than go to the federally licensed dealer and so making it putting up more obstacles for someone like that say, we're not going to have just this easy way for you to get a, get a gun um, make sense. And so I think what it could look like um, is that you have, for a private to private sale, you just have it, you have the interaction take place or tra transaction take place at the, at a federally licensed dealer where they can conduct the background check and then you're all set. So instead of meeting at like the price chopper parking lot, you meet at the, the dealer parking lot and, and you go in and do a background check and you're all set. So. Um, so there would be a, you know, the background check fee, um, which I believe is uh, twenty-five dollars, um, but you know it wouldn't it wouldn't be like a giant hassle. It would mm -hmm. just be sort of some basic, basic, uh, you know, just expanding with the current way that we're doing things to all transactions. Yeah. Is, is there a national database? The uh, the National Criminal Instant Check System, the NCIS, that is set up, and it's you know it's a good start. One thing that we don't do as Vermonters, though, is we don't report any mental health data to, to that. And so that means even public data, like if someone's been adjudicated by a court of law as a danger to themselves or others, um, if they've been found um, not guilty of a crime by reason of insanity, right. you know, those things are not reported to the background check system. Yeah. Um, and so that's something else where, you know, that's in, something In general, really <laughs> they tend to disappear once they leave the, the judicial system. Yeah, uh, and it's one of the things we are going to be working on this year to have more transparency and sharing of this information, and in this regard as, as well. Right, right, and there's certainly, I mean, with mental health data, you have to be. I mean, privacy is a huge concern, but there's certain levels where it's already it's public information to begin with, um, and so you know it makes sense that that all those, the, the dots are being connected and, and everyone's working together. Yeah. Um, we're coming up to the, the one year commemoration. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say the word anniversary because that sounds like celebration. Yeah. Um, it, it's one year since those children that haven't been here anymore. You yeah. know, those parents have been, I mean, I, I can't even imagine. No, I can't either.
including the parents and the teachers. Yeah, yeah. Um, or the or the family. I know one of the sisters has been mm -hmm. very active in, mm -hmm. in advocacy right now. <clears throat> Are there events planned to commemorate yes. the one year? Um, our organization has helped organize uh, 26 vigils throughout the state um, to commemorate the 26 lives that have that were lost at Sandy Hook Elementary. Um, and within Wyndham County, we have um, a few so that people, I, I mean, I think one of the reasons we wanted to do many around the state was that I think this is a time when really you need an intimate you need to be you need to be in an intimate group of your neighbors you know because I think there's two um, I think the vigils can serve two purposes one is to show those families that we have not forgotten them you know that we are holding them in our hearts throughout all of this um, and the other is just from a personal level you know I think so I mean we were all just broken by that last year and um, this issue has so much fear and so much um, in, in every layer of it and I feel like the way to address that is to come together with other people um, yeah. you know like Adam Lanza you know he was isolated you know and it, we can we need to be reaching out to other people okay. you know and um, one of the things that the Sandy Hook families are encouraging people to do is an uh, acts of kindness um, to honor those who were, who were lost. And I think that that is, you know, we want to make the society that we envision um, in our actions. And so, um, so we'll have a number of uh, vigils um, throughout Wyndham County. Um, in Brattleboro, there'll be one at um, Pliny Park at uh, 9.30 a.m. That was the time of the shooting. And so... Um, there's uh, uh, two others at 9.30 also. In Marlboro, um, people are going to meet in front of the post office at 9.30 a.m. In Dummerston, uh, in front of the Dummerston Congregational Church at 9.30. Um, and then at 1.30 in Newfane, in front of the Newfane Congregational Church, there'll be another vigil. Um, in Putney, at the um, Putney Friends Meeting House uh, at 7 p.m. Um, and in uh, Guilford, it's at four o'clock in um, in front of the Guilford Community Church, mm -hmm. and so so I really encourage people to come. And I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, you can in tragedy, you know, you have hope in the way that people come out of it and yeah. coming together in that tragedy, but then um, joining with others, and you can come out feeling hopeful about the world and yeah. you know that we can by working together we can make it the kind of world we want to be living in yeah um, this work is ongoing if people want to be in touch with you and be part of this work how do they get in touch with you um, my uh, well gunsensevt.org gunsensevermont.org is the um, our website uh, my email through that is gunsensevt at gmail.com um, and so that will go directly to me, and um, and uh, yeah, I'd be happy. Any, anyone who's interested in getting involved, the more the merrier, definitely. Yeah. And, and getting involved can be making calls, writing letters. It doesn't mean uh, carrying signs or marching. <laughs> yeah, in the no, and it, it even even it doesn't. You don't even have to be making calls or writing letters. Sometimes it's just a matter of um, you know. Uh, you know, there's lots of different kinds of opportunities, and so if you if you can get on our email list, um, then then you know what opportunities there are, and so you can sort of pick and choose what works yeah, for you. Great. Um, and on the website, there's a join link, so you can you can join that way as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for taking the time, thanks. and and thank you so much for your for your work and helping make make this a better community and a better world. My pleasure. Okay, um, that's all for today. Uh, until next time, I'm. State Representative Mike Merwicki. Thanks again to all the people at BCTV here for making this possible, and take care. Bye-bye.